Thank you for joining us on another episode of Latter Gay Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Ashworth, and you are at the intersection of sexuality and religion, where it meets at LGBTQ Avenue and LDS Street. We want to thank you for giving us an hour of your time to better understand this intersection and to help us build bigger and stronger bridges between the LDS and LGBTQ community. We've got a fantastic episode for you today. I always say it, but I always mean it, because it seems like every episode builds upon the last, and it gives us each an opportunity to... Uh, better understand this intersection by hearing other people's stories. So another fantastic episode uh, in store. We want to thank, uh, thank those who are watching on a video version of this uh, podcast episode, especially those who are on YouTube, which has become a quite popular channel for us uh, to be able to share these stories in and out of Mormonism. Uh, a large percentage of our, our YouTube audience has never been a Latter-day Saint, uh, are never Moes. They uh, simply come from... Uh, backgrounds, religious backgrounds that are typically orthodox in nature, and uh, it's very similar to Mormonism. And just like Mormonism, their churches aren't talking about this topic either. So welcome to those who are birds of a feather who are also seeking to better understand this space, uh, whether they're uh, directly within it or uh, influenced by it. And for those of you who are listening on an audio version of the podcast, we invite you to subscribe uh, and share and like uh, wherever you are listening to this audio podcast. We again want to welcome uh, those who are listening on the Amazon family of podcasts. We want to thank Amazon for giving us an opportunity to share the Latter Gay Stories podcast on their platform. And it's because of listeners and viewers like you uh, who made the Latter Gay Stories popular enough that Amazon picked us up. So uh, to all, we want to say thank you. So that aside, I want to welcome uh, the Fisk family uh, to the Latter Gay Stories podcast. Uh, Dan and Sarah, hello. Hey. Thank and i um, excited to have you in the, the, uh, the studio because... Your story is a little different than the typical um, I ed- identify as stories that we listen to on the Latter Gay Stories podcast. So, so thank you for being our um, our parents and our allies and and giving us an opportunity to better understand your story. Thank you. Excited to be here. Yeah, really, really. I'm really excited to have you here as well. Um, I mean, we could tease this a variety of different ways, but really, the um, I think the beauty in your story is how um, unforeseen or unexpected circumstances in our lives lead us to um, new uh, opportunities to love and new opportunities to give us uh, the strength and the ability and the knowledge and maybe even the capacity to love others in a way we didn't previously think we were capable or possible of doing. So that's a little bit of a 30,000 foot view of what we might talk about today. Mm-hmm. Perfect. So um, to help the audience better understand um, more of your story. Uh, Sarah, let's start with you. Tell us a little bit about yourself, just a brief background and understanding, and and then we'll go to your husband. I grew up in Central California in a uh, strong LDS family, but uh, there were not a lot of Mormons where I lived. Um, I was the only member of the church in my class at my small high school. It was a farming community. Uh, so our stake was spread out over like two hours from from furthest points. And so um, the church really was our family. We didn't have a uh, blood family living nearby. And it was really uh, where we spent a, a lot of time in a lot of uh, service, you know, meetings, all the things that I think is part of a, a typical Latter-day Saint upbringing. But um, the church really was everything to to me and to my family. I wanted nothing more than to go to BYU, which I did. Um, it was really BYU where I settled into really just loving being a very orthodox, um, rule-keeping, commandment-keeping member of the church. I was a Relief Society president, um, served a mission in Bolivia. We got married in the temple and Throughout my church service, it it was everything to me. I loved it. I was the president of everything that, a, you know, a female member of the church can be a president of. Participated wholeheartedly, and um, it it was it was such a significant. I I don't. It, it's hard to overstate how significant the church was for me growing up. Dan, what about you? Yeah, I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm the oldest of uh, four four kids. Um, uh, my mom was a member of the church. My dad wasn't. Um, and uh, that created a really interesting dynamic. I think just looking back on it, just understanding kind of who I am. And I think just really being able to see both sides, both in and out of the church. Um, 
my uh, my mom basically raised us and took us to took us to church every week and uh, or I say basically raised us. Sorry, my mom basically brought us to church every week. She was the she was the reason we were so orthodox. And um, I served a mission. Uh, I went to Santiago, Chile. Um, you know, gosh, almost three decades ago. <laughs> And, um, you know, I, an amazing experience. Um, you know, I often say, especially when you talk about LGBTQ issues, uh, the church was made for me. I was white, affluent, heterosexual, male, cisgendered, you know, it, it was, I was Eagle Scout, you know, like a young men program. It was just great. I had a wonderful experience growing up in the church. Um, and so consequently just never really saw anything to pay attention to, you know, uh, behind the curtains and really. Um, not really until I came, uh, not, got back from my mission. I was up at BYU and Sarah and I had actually already met, uh, we're dating and my brother came home from his mission and, um, and came out to me in, in our, in our room. It was late at night, the door, the, the, the lights were off and, you know, the sun was setting and, and he, 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 it took so much courage for him. Um, he'd actually gotten, it came out to his, um, friends, um, first and was just needed their coaching that to, so that he could have the courage and they encouraged him to, to come out to me and it was beautiful I actually didn't believe him at first <laughs> I, I said you're not you're not gay and he said Dan I was Wonder Woman for Halloween three years in a row and just in a in an instant it all made sense you know and um and, and at the same time my I didn't love him less or, or none of that of course but I also uh unconscious you know again this is all looking back and describing it now but um you know it, it really it was a shock but but he it, it was interesting about his story is he actually when he came out he read his patriarchal blessing to me and he said i i i, I, I still want a family i want to get married in the temple and for a brief period of time he he really kind of just felt like maybe he could um pray the gay away he was still he he tried that on his mission it didn't work right and he came back and he still was homosexual and and, uh, but that semester was really interesting because I think he, he even just weeks later transitioned into a, a, a just an understanding that, that no, that it's not going to be that way. And he's going to, he's going to be able to really kind of live a, a life outside the church. And, um, yeah, it, it, it just kind of finished that side of that story is, is as he came out, it was, I had uh, a lot of judgment still towards him and, um, going to BYU and not you know, telling his ecclesiastical, his bishop, you know, the, that he was gay and that still attending, you know, graduating from BYU under the pretense that, that he, um, uh, you know, wasn't gay. And, and, and I remember that was, you know, looking back, um, that's kind of how I felt about it. And it wasn't until a few years later that, uh, we'd moved away. I graduated college and we just really wanted a relationship with him and a lot of fear that we had about his influence on our kids and, you know, it just all that just went out, went away. And we just, he was so patient and so loving. And really that was like the early 2000s. And that was, I think, the start of re, me personally, and, and I know Sarah as well, really, really kind of uh, facing that and, and, and really kind of looking at ourselves and, and say, what, what is it? A, I think, I think I'm the issue here. It's, it's not my brother. And, and lastly, I'll say, um, just to kind of on that story is I, I think, there was a couple things, a couple conversations that really were um, instrumental in my my shift in understanding more and loving more. And one was when a college roommate called me, um, and I told him that my brother was dating this 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 guy, and they'd lived in Atlanta, and they were probably going to get married. And I was so excited to go to my first gay wedding. And my my college roommate really worthy calls me back five minutes later. And he's like, Dan, I just doesn't sit well with me. He's like. I don't understand, like, I feel like you should be testifying to him and he shouldn't be doing that. And, you know, you should really, you know, he could come back to church and you should be a good example. And he's like, but I know that I know you and I, I just, I must be missing something. And he says, yeah, what you're missing is having a gay brother. I will always choose my brother before the church. And that kind of blew both our minds as I said that out loud. And I was just, I was, and those, those are kind of just really beautiful experiences in my journey. Um, and then of course, just, you know, all the conversations that you can now have openly. And then, um, and of course my transition out of the church, I, st I lost belief in the church as the one true church, you know, probably about 10 years ago. And, and that made it a lot easier. I know Craig and I mar marched in our first gay bride parade and here in Phoenix in 2015 together and, and Sarah and our family did with our kids. And so it, be, it just became this beautiful journey, which we can talk about more together, but that was, uh, 
that's more or less uh, the story. <laughs> I, and I love it. So um, I think we should build. We, we should build with, um, we'll start the... We'll start the episode, this podcast episode, with our Mormon goggles on, um, because I think that's going to be familiar space for a lot of us. Mm -hmm. um, and you, I think, did a really great job in in building um, that experience, this dichotomy that we run into between um, people and policy. Maybe we start there. Mm -hmm. How you had been taught certain things um, in your upbringing about people like me and people like your brother. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about that. Let's talk about what you remember the church teaching, uh, what you know from um, your both respective families about this topic, and how that framed those uh, initial feelings of disdain, um, uncomfort um, surrounding your brother's sexuality. Yeah. Um you know, the church, as you know, is this super orthodox and um, about that. And, you know, what is it? The uh, you're just saying the other day, the three enemies of the church are intellectuals. Right. Well, I, I went to BYU and we both did. And I remember that at that time there was a lot of focus on um, kind of cleaning out the radicals in the church. And up until that, I don't think I had a whole lot of teaching around being gay, I knew it was a sin and I knew it was a bad sin. Um, but Ezra Taft Benson, a prophet of the church, said that the three threats to the church were intellectuals, feminists, and homosexuals. And I took that literally. Like it was a threat to the one true church that I loved, that I believed was the only true church on the face of the earth. And so that was a lot of the teaching that I remember getting specifically around that. Yeah. And to be to be fair, I I I think that my 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 parents were rather uh, liberal. They weren't conservative, and when my brother came out, they were very loving and accepting of it. Um, my dad, not being a member of the church, really didn't, had strong feelings either way about homosexuality. My mom didn't really either, um, and so I would kind of describe it as I just didn't notice any teachings as a young man. Um, and then, really, it wasn't until after he came out that I started noticing what the how how the church feels about uh, gays. And, um, it, it was, it was truly like, um, a cognitive dissonance, you know, this dichotomy It's like, I want to hold on to the truth of the church. And I also want to love my brother. And I think that, that a lot of members of the church coexist in that space. Right. And, and the way I would describe it is, is I was able to discard certain doctrines that I didn't believe were true. So I would, and I would tell people early on before I'd really left the church, I'd say, you know, you could, you don't have to believe in polygamy. Like that doesn't have to be true to you. You know, you also can just fully accept uh, the the LGBTQ community. You, you don't you don't have to, you know, espouse those doctrines. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it it that was my experience. And funny because I'm listening to that, thinking um, with those goggles on, um, you're ex you're describing something that is uh, uh, super frowned upon in Mormonism. We call that a cafeteria Mormon. So yes, who is is okay just picking and choosing what portions of the church that they believe in. So just being devil's advocate here for those who are still fully ingrained, that's likely what they're saying is, well, see, you were just off the rails a little bit. You just decided um, that there's certain parts of the gospel you want to cling to, the ones that are convenient and comfortable. But this is a, a great example of separating the wheat from the tare. And this is where you're beginning to fall. Uh, and, and we can... I, I yeah. propose that hypothetically because yeah. I think we can all just kind of nod our head and say, oh yeah, like, I, and I even remember being one of those uh, stone cast, casters mm -hmm. and not a stone catcher. I think in the beginning, our our response to Craig was very typically LD, from, from an LDS standpoint. Yeah. Craig, we love you, but what you are doing is wrong. What you are choosing is wrong. And this was in 1990, uh, 90, 98, 99, and that's back when the church was actually still cho uh, teaching that gay, that being gay is a choice and that you better choose again. <laughs> and so our reaction to him, I think, was very typical until we just, and, and I guess speaking for me, I had that, I sat with it. I got to sit with it for years and years and years. And I remember 
one morning sitting in my home thinking about Craig as a person and it dawned on me like I just don't think this is a choice like how how does it make sense that this is something he's choosing what Latter-day Saint man chooses to burn down his life his uh, you know potential associations and, and family his his eternity to choose this and I felt in my body and in my heart that it was not right. The very same way I had felt that the church was right, that serving a mission was right, that I wanted to get married to Dan in the temple. And so, you know, this is kind of in response to your devil's advocate thing is that either the spirit reveals truth or it doesn't. It, it can't only reveal truth sometimes. And so the very same mechanism by which I had understood things to be good and right and true, I understood that Craig was born this way, that God loved him exactly as he was, and that it did not make sense that this was something that he was choosing. And so I would just say, you can't have it both ways. Either the spirit speaks the truth through the way we've been taught it does, and that's how I felt that that was true, or he doesn't. Yeah, I really see why that quote, the enemies of the church, because what happens is once you have someone close to you, uh, who you love, uh, like like in my case, my brother who came out, I really have him to thank for giving really, really, like you were saying, like be, being forced to pause and, and really think about what you believe and what you've been taught and really question. And um, that for me led into other, you know, really kind of deep dive into church history, but really it was it was the conversations with him it was what sarah just said about um the very the very tools the very the very teachings that they gave us to be curious and 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 as members of the church and to uh, seek for truth yeah you know that that it was so obvious to me that he he was born that way that he didn't choose that and i think that just realization it didn't take long right for for the the slippery slope um, but but I have him to thank because, because that was a big watershed moment for me um, to have that realization. Yeah, and I, I, as I'm listening to this, I'm thinking, like, society doesn't typically teach us that being gay is a choice. Um, that, that isn't something that we just walk around, read billboards around town and say, oh, or even in school. We typically receive that through our uh, religious areas, uh, t typically uh, church. Um, so religion teaches us that, um, that difference. Um, and I, I kind of like that term, the slippery slope, because it does, um, it indicates more than just a faltering testimony. The slippery slope is also the ways by which we are indoctrinated and given information. Mm -hmm. And you know, I mean, one gripe, if I want to call it gripe, if we, I mean, take the gloves off a little bit, is that often in this space, uh, where we talk about queer issues and queer experiences, um, the majority of the people who are making decisions and calling the shots and and writing the rules for queer people aren't queer themselves. They're straight. Exactly. Mm. And that is an unfortunate problem for religion. And I'm not just saying just Mormonism, but all religions who um, have a, a narrative against queer people, those narratives are created by people who are straight. Yeah, who get to be married, who get to have partners, who get to enjoy all of the benefits of human intimacy and companionship and belonging. And one of the, I think one of the largest problems, uh, kind of perpetual problems in that space is by uh, training your congregants that you have the truth and we can tell you exactly what this experience is like. It then leads the members to believe that the only people who can tell them about queer experiences or the only authorities on queer experiences are non-queer people, yeah. which it be, does a disservice to all of us, both people within the LGBTQ community and those who are trying to better understand the LGBTQ experience. So I just frame that like uh, understanding the, the real importance of, of what Craig's experience does for your family and for my family and how the individual queer experience does benefit and help others. Yeah, because all of a sudden this is a person. Now all of these policies and all of this rhetoric and all of these, this doctrine applies to this person sitting in front of me. And it changes it completely because now I can imagine Craig's life 
not married, not with no part, with no, like no opportunity to enjoy all of what we know is just so essential to human experience. Like he's just going to never have that. It just, it doesn't make any sense. It's really easy to, to, uh, it, when you're in a position of power to, um, other someone you don't know. And, and so the, the I always, um, like I said before, I'm so grateful for that. He is my brother. Um, but I'm also grateful for all the other, uh, wonderful people in my life, you know, in the LGBT community and, um, that I'm still learning. And that, that's another key takeaway I'd like to share is that, is that much like it took me years to get to the point just to accept and then, and then really deeply love and then, and then really be moved from like, you know, uh, an ally to maybe an advocate. Right. And, and, you know, it, it really, it, it, it really, for me, that took more than just him. Right. And, and other friends. And, um, uh, and I think that I was really just grateful for that experience. Um, I wonder, and I'm, I'm sure I know the answer to this, but shifting from your now experience with your brother or brother-in-law, um, how does that now frame your ability to sucker, run to, um, better understand, befriend other people in your sphere that come out? And whether that's in church, um, in your social circle, or even at work, um, were there others then who, who now, because your vision was a little less cloudy to this particular group of people, uh, did that give you an opportunity to help and see them as they are? A hundred percent. Cause in 2017, our daughter came out and I can't, I just don't even know what it would have been like had we not had Craig because having him in our lives and deciding I remember the day that he he and his partner had invited us to come. They lived in Atlanta and they'd invited us to come out for Thanksgiving. And we looked at each other and we were like, should we go? Is it, is it going to be okay for our kids to see this? Is it? And we decided like, Craig, Craig knows how we feel. All he's asking is, do we want to have a loving relationship? And the answer for us to that is yes. And so as we told people about our upcoming trip, we had a lot of people express worry, like, what is it going to do to your kids? What is it going to... Is it going to confuse them? Is or, or is it you know going to have some kind of influence on them? And we decided that whatever that was, we could handle it. And what it did was it created a conversation in our home about Uncle Craig and Uncle Craig getting to make choices for his life that he felt were the right ones that benefited him, that um, that felt good to him. And it opened up the conversation in our home to include the possibility that one of our kids might someday come out. We didn't know who, uh, we didn't even know if that was, you know, uh, for sure going to happen, but it opened up the way that we talked about dating, about having crushes, about falling in love, about, um, forming relationships and that it could be a female, it could be male, it could be, um, some, something unexpected. And it became a little bit of a, of a joke in that, you know, I would ask one of my sons, Hey, who's, who's your date with? on Tuesday and or Friday and he would say girl and then you know we'd have it, it just it was always something that was open and so all of that laid just such a beautiful trusting loving backdrop for our daughter to tell us that she is gay how did that um I love the specifics like those examples <laughs> uh because I think those are those are what the audience especially uh, Latter-day Saint families or families who um, may not even know that they have a queer child. Mm. Yeah. Um, those types of examples are super important, and I don't think I don't think we talk about them enough because I know in my own experience, and likely in yours, uh, um, especially let's just just talk about gay dating for example. Um, so many people come on this podcast to say, "I come out in my twenties or thirties, late in life." Um, sometimes after multiple failed marriages or even after mixed orientation marriages, and then they begin queer dating as dating someone of their same gender. And the problem they run into is where do you learn or get trained or find understanding uh, on how to queer date? Those examples are nowhere. Yeah. There's no steak dance. There's no word <laughs> uh, social. There's no uh, 
classic skating snowball opportunity. Uh, like we just aren't equipping, uh, like geared or equipped to be able to teach or re readily give these opportunities to people who may need them the most. And so I, I want to dive into this a little bit further. Like what other examples and what other things um, did you use was on, under your own roof in your own household to better understand and teach your kids um, how open and honest and and kind of beautiful this whole space really is and to that gave them the ability to not even worry about it well first of all we expanded our 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 network of friends beyond just my brother you know who are gay and and i think and having those people in our home friends that we call close friends and and normalizing just this is these are just our friends and they happen to be gay and down to, yeah, let's have specific discussions about what the challenges are uh, with being gay, especially within the church. Because at the time, I mean, we're talking mid to, you know, 2013 through 17, 18, that, that was really kind of a, you know, a, ha, ha, half in, half out in terms of the church for, you know, Sarah and the kids at the time. I, I, I left first, but, but that created an opportunity for a lot of discussions. And um, yeah, to Sarah's point, we were able to... Um, you know, because Rachel in 2017, when she was 16, came out to us, that was a beautiful opportunity for us to e even get even more involved and more curious ourselves. Um, and what do you think? I remember the first time Craig brought a partner to our home. Our oldest was probably eight, seven or eight. And I said, Uncle Craig is coming with his boyfriend. And she said, you mean girlfriend? And I said, no, I mean boyfriend. And she said, what? And I said, some people like girls, some people like boys. And that was all she needed. Mm -hmm. And so I think early on, um, we tried to explain things in a way that was understandable. And we let it be driven by their questions and curiosity. And as, as they grew and as Dan left the church in 2013, it the foundational belief was that Everybody gets to make the decisions for themselves that they think are best. This is what Uncle Craig thinks is best for him. And we agree that he should do what is best for him. We love him. We want him to feel happy with his life. And someday you will get to make your own decisions. Dad has chosen that he doesn't want to go to church anymore right now. And that is a choice that he gets to make. And someday you will get to choose who you love, what you decide to do with your life. And that is a sacred privilege like that to me as a still believing you know practicing mormon um that's the whole point right to be to have the agency to choose and to be responsible for your choices and to enjoy that and so i think that was an integral thing that we we just talked about all the time that everybody gets to pick and you will have the chance to do that too and it felt so right saying those words at the time too you know like i i, I it just Thinking back even 10 years prior, how I would have reacted to that had I not had a gay brother, had, had you know, those things hadn't happened in my life, what I, what I would have thought. But in the moment when you had those experiences, it was so easy to, to teach your kids those truths because they're true, that love is love. And yeah, it was, it was beautiful. I understand that there are probably people listening who are like, actually, Sarah, you've got it wrong. You don't get to pick. You have to choose this path. And I remember... I just remember so clearly understanding that if Craig stays on this path, he'd rather die. And so I don't think that a loving and the God that I met and was taught about and got to know through my upbringing in the LDS church, I can't imagine that that's what he wants. And so if the choice is to stay on the path and live with suicidality or complete suicide that just makes no sense to me and so it can only make sense that a god who created people to love who they love would also want them to be able to make choices around that and that he's fine with it that he can totally handle the choices that we make and that us living a long and happy life is more important than obeying rules but don't you think um and Clearly, I'm only de devil's advocating. Yeah, please. Uh, because I've been in this space so long yeah. um, that I 
I feel like sometimes I'm I'm just uh, the scriptures call it kicking against the pricks. I call it banging my head against the wall in in this space so often against um, members of, of of people of faith who hear stories like this or who refuse to accept. Um, but listening to to that what you just explained, Sarah. Um, I, I hear that the counter argument that I hear so often is that um, clearly you've missed the boat. This is 100% the reason why we have church leaders to act on your behalf. This is the reason why now you have a, a mixed faith family. You, you have given autonomy where autonomy is not necessary and you have deviated from the plan. And as you deviate from there, you will quickly see that um, you'll lose blessings, you'll lose spirituality, you'll lose um, all these opportunities for happiness. It seems like the, the deck is now stacked against um, being the very thing that the churches should be, kind and supportive and uh, Christ-like. And so I don't know if there, there's a question in there as much as there is to me an observation. For those who, who look at this say, Clearly, your whole family is an example of um, cafeteria Mormonism, of the slippery slope. Now you've got a mixed faith relationship that's fallen apart. Um, you have now given into uh, evil Satan by supporting and, and lifting and advocating for a queer community. You brought this all on yourself. Yeah, absolutely, and it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I think that I think that that perspective, and I totally get it because. Well, thank you. We'll clarify. We were actually not cafeteria Mormons up until, right, this thing started, you know, you know, let's call it 10 years ago. So for 40 years, I was absolutely, I mean, Elder Scrum president, you know, high leader, you know, young men's stake presidency, like, like I was in it and I believed it all. Um, but when I hear those, that perspective, I simultaneously understand where you're coming from because I would have said the same thing. And, I, and if I'm being honest, I'm speaking from a point of fear when I do that, when I, when I, if I would have said that. And so when I see that articulated, what I hear is that you're scared because what if you're wrong, you know, potentially, and, and cause, cause it is beautiful. What, what we've experienced, we are, can't even describe, I, I often say what I sought for, what was described for me in the LDS church as the epitome of joy. And you could fill in what circumstances that would get you to that, have those feelings. I never felt, I was never achieved that. And, and I was always felt like, so with it, not within reach for some reason. And of course you, there's so much self-loathing though. It's because I've sinned or, you know, et cetera. I now have that, 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 that just complete peace with who I am and the people I love and who love me, the amount of joy and happiness we have in where we are now is just really indescribable. And um, I, I really just view it as an invitation. You know, um, when, I, when I think about it, I think if I can some way invite you to consider our story uh, as true, for, you know, it, it's true, it's, it's, it's real, it's, it, it, um, it is, uh, it's beautiful and um, I think that the only way it's, it, we experience it is because we made certain choices that were scary, uh, to, to choose certain people over doctrine and policies. And I can tell you, it was absolutely the right decision for us. Um, I think sometimes, um, we fear that opportunity to sucker and lean into and better un understand these experiences. For that very like honest, candid explanation you just just gave, um, the one on one hand we say I fear being wrong. Uh, how how can I, as a active church going Latter Day Saint or Protestant evangelical, say to myself, um, your church isn't teaching you everything you need to know about a certain group of people, and that fear scares you absolutely to death. 
And then um, when you see how it impacts for, to, for the better another group of people, you're faced with this dichotomy saying, what was once something that felt so wrong, I can clearly see has brought joy. And, and that's where this really cracks open. And to me, that's where we start leading into this experience with your daughter, because all I see all of your story, um, this preparation um, in getting to better understand Craig and getting to understand his experience as an opportunity for you as parents to be the very best parents possible and show up in the, in the most beautiful and authentic way for your own kids and now for your daughter. So let's talk about that coming out experience. Um, how did that happen? And um, honest moments, I, I really want to understand exactly how you felt and how you reacted as your daughter shared uh, something so important and special to her. You know what? It was remarkably unremarkable. <laughs> I was in the kitchen sitting at our, our table she plopped down in the seat next to me. I remember we were cutting an apple and sharing it. And she said, I want to tell you about my crush. I was like, ooh, I said, what's his name? And she said, her name is, and then she, I don't remember the name. And my face stayed exactly the same. I had a big smile. I mean, tell me all about her. She's like, mom, she's on my volleyball team. And I, every time I look at her and I'm around her, I get this like weird tingly feeling. <laughs> and I'm just, I find myself like watching her a lot. I was like, yeah, yeah, it feels pretty good, huh? And my insides were a completely different mm -hmm. story. I was, I was terrified. I was um, shocked. I would have never in a gazillion years thought that it would be this child. Um, but I just kept telling myself I was, I had my hands on the table and I was like wringing my fingers, like just stay here just stay right here just stay right here it'll be okay and she got up after like maybe a 10 minute conversation bounced out of the kitchen and that was it it was remarkably unremarkable and then I started with the oh my gosh 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 what does this mean and really the only work that had to be done was I had to reground and recenter myself in what I already knew to be true because I had learned it with Craig and now I just got to apply that same learning to my own child and the most significant thing for me was that I just knew in that moment it was as if a, a timer had started on my membership in the church and I just knew that I was not going to be able to stay I didn't know how long Dan had already left you know like three or four years previous to that. And I had been the one to really double down and say, all right, well, I'm going to be the one to take them to church then and to really make sure that this eternal family thing still happens. Um, and in that moment, I just knew the same way I had known other things that we couldn't stay. Yeah, it, I wasn't there for that conversation. You know, um, and uh, but what was beautiful is, um, again, when I when you related to me or mm -hmm. uh, that night, um, I just remember being like, oh, great, you know, but I also thought it was interesting too. just looking back, the thought I have, maybe a lot of listeners can relate to this as a parent when your child comes out to you. Um, she was really boy crazy at the time, you know, up until that point, even after for, I mean, a couple of few years, right? She dated a, a couple really guys. And I just thought, uh, and I think this is common, especially, um, if you haven't, uh, thought about it a lot, but I think you think, oh, well, if they're bisexual, they'll probably just choose, continue to choose the, the dating boys because that's what she's been doing. And I also thought, well, maybe it was just like one of these phases. Maybe she just said, maybe it wasn't really bisexuality. Maybe it was just, not that I was voting against it. I was just, but I remember my, my programming was to think those things for whatever reason. And then I was, and then, you know, a few years later when she, um, I uh, had broken up with a a boy and just she said, I'm just going to start dating girls, you know, go on dates with girls. And she, and she started to go on a lot of dates with girls. And I remember at that point thinking, Oh, she really is like bisexual. Like, like, and again, it's, I don't want to make that sound at all worse. I, I, I wasn't uh, at all, obviously like against it. I just, 
I just remember having this epiphany, like, like I hadn't given it much thought because it was kind of like something that happened when she's 16 to one conversation. Didn't really talk about it much until uh, at least uh, maybe there's more on your side, not, not many conversations about it. And then dating girls, that was really cool because then the, the conversations happen more. Um, I thought that was an interesting thing that happened in my programming, you know, when she came out. As parents, um, you have to have some fear, some fear that um, this is uncharted territory and this is really difficult to navigate for a number of reasons. One, you have never gay dated. So this is unfamiliar territory for you as parents as well on ways to um, advocate for and also give advice and counsel to your daughter. I'm curious where you found those opportunity, opportunities to teach your daughter um, about boundaries and safeguards and kind of, I don't want to say steering because I, I don't think as parents, I don't get the, the feeling that you wanted to steer your child, but guide. How, how were you able to guide your daughter uh, to healthy relationships and helping her understand who and what she was? We talked a lot about that just in the context of relationships in general. Um, and right, at, right after she came out, we had her call Craig and talk with him. And, and he gave her what I thought was just fantastic advice. He just said, you know what, Rachel, if I were you, I wouldn't tell anyone just yet. Just sit with it yourself. Study it. Feel your own attraction because it could be different for different people or different situations or different genders. And he said, once you come out, you can't take that back. So just be sure that when you are ready to come out, part of that readiness also includes the readiness to deal with other people's reactions. And so she decided to not tell anyone outside of our close family. And she was happy dating men, men, boys at the time. <laughs> um, and it was, she said, you know, I think if I ever... When I want to date girls, that'll be in college. I think I'll save that. And so mm. I felt like that really gave her a roadmap and also the chance to just sit with her feelings and notice and learn from herself. So the best advice really came from her gay uncle. Yeah, I remember. That was great. Yeah, that was great. Again, such a blessing. Um, he, I remember immediately being like, this is so cool. You have a gay uncle. <laughs> like, we should, like, you know, get get some input there. And I remember we were in the jacuzzi. It was uh we had him and uh, Aaron and and you and me and and, and Rachel and we, and just watching her, you know, open up and just I mean it was really the joy on my brother's face, you know, to to be able to be there and part of this. I just I thought that was a beautiful experience for him, you know, to be so helpful and 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 have such just be so have such good um, the timing and the advice and and to be a part of that experience was beautiful. It's one thing to have uh, super affirming parents who understand and are able to help your daughter in these situations. And I don't even like the word, as I said that, I, don't, I didn't even like that word situation because this isn't a situation. This isn't a problem. This yeah. isn't something that we uh, try to overcome or fix or yeah. work around. This is a reality. This yeah. is who she is. Um, so as parents, it's, it's one thing to be able to navigate that and, and learn together. I'm curious how the other kids in the family uh, reacted to the news and what were their uh, opportunities and methods to help support their sister? I don't remember a big reaction. Like it was remarkably unremarkable. I think they were like, oh, Rachel's gay. Okay. Um, and especially because she didn't uh, come out widely, you know, right away and she still continued to date boys for a while. It just was a non-event. And that's one of the things that I am happiest about is that there's no coming out trauma. There's no, um, you know, sadness and and some of the, the, the typical things that happen, the shock, the surprise, the disappointment, the despair, that was 100% absent from her coming out in our family. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and, and I, and that's, uh, I mean, it has a lot to do with the times we live in, you know, um, uh, you know, the high schoolers at the time, you know, that they, they were very much, I mean, so many kids were able to come out, you know, at that time. Um, but yeah, I think we were pretty fortunate and, uh, 
earlier uh, in the podcast, uh, prior to us recording the podcast, you uh, talked about an experience at the Mesa Temple. Um, because now that your periphery has expanded, your ability to um, bring in a uh, the the circle expanded. This opportunity to meet more people and see other people um, gave your family more experiences. And I want you to share with the audience that experience. So the other thing that really helped with Rachel coming out is we already had a lot of gay friends. And one of our gay friends who has never been a Mormon wanted to go to the the temple here in in the area where we live had undergone renovations and they were inviting the public to come in. And she was very curious and asked us if we would take her. So we went and I had uh, I was with my best friend at the time, uh, Andrea, and kind of, I don't know, impulsively, I grabbed her hand and I said, let's just see what happens. And so I'm holding her hand as we're walking through the temple. And I, I mean, it makes me a little emotional. I was shocked by how the looks changed, by how the the pointed um, attention was focused on us with faces that and, and I'm guessing, I realize I'm doing some guessing about what people were thinking, but I am used to going through life with people looking at me and smiling, people looking at me and returning the smile that I give them. Um, and that stopped. And I thought, if this is even just a microcosm of what gay people experience walking down the street, holding the hand of the person they love. It's a lot. It's a lot. And so unfair. Soul crushing. I mean, to be looked at like there's something wrong with you by someone who doesn't even know you, to be looked at like you're doing something wrong by someone who has no knowledge of you. My daughter, uh, for a time, lived in Provo and talked about walking down the street, holding her girlfriend's hand, being called fags, you know, horrible, horrible language screamed at them, being told to, you know, leave. And that's the kind of thing that you wish you could always protect your children from. But the beauty of the way our relationship has unfolded is that because she has us, those things are upsetting, but we are always the the safe place for her to talk about them, to uh, process them, and to be told that that is wrong and that she is good and that she is loved and that she is perfect. What is that? I mean, clearly, I think we know the answer to this, but what, what has that done for her? Um, how How is she in very real ways express that that's been helpful to her. Yeah. Um, I love my relationship with my daughter. Um, it, it means a lot. Other, you know, uh, other people around her tell, will, will tell me how much they, she appreciates relationship with with me and us, and um, it is flattering because uh, she's she's very uh, complimentary, um, and I think I hope I hope that that it's created the the safe space for her and our and our other kids, um, and uh, I feel like that there is no there's nothing between us. There's no um, ugly history or, or wedge, right. That I, I see sometimes in other relationships, um, par parental child relationships where the child is, is gay. And, um, and, and for that, I'm really grateful. Um, yeah. What it has created and, and she's never said this explicitly, but she has said it in a hundred, you know, ways in which she acts is that she trusts us to hold whatever she has to say with the respect and dignity of another human who is honored as a human, not as somebody who is expected to act the way we expect her to act, not someone who is expected to emulate 
her parents' path in any way, that she has parents who love her and respect her as a sovereign human, but who will also give her good information and tell her the truth about things. Because kids, I mean, man, you have lots of questions. You run into lots of situations where you don't know what is right, what is wrong, what is helpful, what is not helpful. And so, yeah, talking about her being gay has been one important thing, but it's only been one thing among the hundred times, thousands of times that she has come to us asking for guidance and sharing, I think, some pretty remarkable, you know, things that most kids wouldn't share with their parents about dating and about, you know, d discovering who you are. But I, I'm sure that she would say um, that the reason that she has felt so safe and so able to share so much with us is because of our commitments to her having her path and her life. I think there are some who will listen um, to your your episode, what you've said here today, and say, I wish my parents were like you. What advice would you have to that queer person who sits on the other side of this interview and listens to your story and says, how do I help my parents? How do I get my parents to be Dan and Sarah? Or, or some, something similar to Dan and Sarah? That's, well, I think just, that's really, that's a really hard thing um, for anyone to wish that they had different parents who reacted differently uh, on this important issue, right? And um, so I would first, if I was talking to a young person about that or any person about that who asked me that question, I would probably caution them to, 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 to put high, such a high standard on, on their, but have compassion if, if you can, if you could, if you can find the compassion for your parents in that situation first, um, because it's gotta be hard to walk around wishing that things were so different when they probably won't be in the near future. And then the second side I would say is have patience. It's amazing how much people, we change so much as humans every few years in terms of what we believe, the information, the information we get. I mean, um, so, so on one hand, I would say be patient because, um, especially if it's, a, if, if, I mean, if you love your parents and they love you, but this is still like a wedge issue. Like I firmly believe that, that, that it, they will come around, that there will be movement. Um, maybe not as quick as you want, but have faith that it'll happen, but it, it, it can't be forced. You can't force someone to change who they are, what they believe, but, um, you certainly can, uh, you can, you can, and it's just so cliche, be an example. Just, just live your life as, as a good person, as a good gay person. Like, you know, just, you can still be such an example to all the people around you. And I think your parents who love you, uh, I think they'll see that. They'll see the joy in your life. And I think that it'll come around. Yeah, that's, that's a, that's a great piece of advice. As I talk with queer people often, uh, typically behind the scenes, as they reach out with these I ask that question because it specifically is one that's brought up over and over and over again in mm. in this space. I wish I had parents that loved me. I wish I had parents who understood me. I wish I had parents who just had an iota of interest in my dating life and had an interest in who I was interested in. And it breaks my heart. And the advice that I give give them often is similar to what you just talked about, Dan, that uh, we need to extend layers of grace is how I often frame that. These layers of grace are opportunities for people to learn line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. And often for the queer person, and this may be better relatable, um, we have 20, 30, 40, 50 years to understand uh, who and what we are. And when we give our parents or those that we love 20, 30, or 40 seconds, yeah. and we don't get the reaction that we hoped, we have to extend grace. Mm -hmm. And we have to give them the opportunity to learn this. Um, and I, the difficult part is sometimes it will take the same amount of time that it, gave, that it took us to mm -hmm. finally come out, and the same amount of time that it took us to realize who and what we are for others to do the same but we need to know that this is a process. Yeah. 100%. I would just say that 
as that process is unfolding to a young queer person or older queer person who says, I wish my parents were like that, I would say, so do I. And you deserve loving, connected relationships in which you are respected and understood for who you are. And that starts with you treating yourself that way and setting the standard of how you will be treated, how you will be spoken to, how you will be um, accepted, and then find other people who meet that standard for you. It might not be your parents. And so if you can work out some kind of truce where you can exist in the same space and, and whatever that looks like for you, great, do that. But also find loving, connected, accepted, accepting people who aren't your parents because that's what we're built for and everyone deserves that and there are people out there who will love and respect you exactly for who you are right now and if you have both of those you know the possible truce or ceasefire going on with parents and other loving connected relationships that enrich and really serve as the guide for your standard of relationship then I think you're in a much better place to to be the kind of patient, you know, loving child of parents who aren't accepting yet, because your your need for connection and fulfillment, you're getting that as well. No one should have to live without that. I think this is a great segue into uh, the part of the podcast that I want to talk about resources. I want to talk about where people like you turned to find better resources on how to navigate this. Because I don't think you just shot off the the cuff here. I um. Where, because I know this is, this is super confusing space for a lot of parents. Uh, when their children come out, they, I mean, often are just inundated with a lot of emotion. And we talked about this earlier, um, especially for Latter-day Saint families, there is this grief process mourning the celestial kingdom, mm. this process where we have to, the, the literal, we put away what we thought was going to happen with our children and then reframe that and, and try to pick up what pieces are left and, and begin to work with that. So do you recall any specific resources or where did you turn to find community, to find other, other families who are in your similar situation? Um, and, and if there were some that were helpful and some that weren't so helpful, I'd be super interested in that part of the discussion. One of the first things we did um, when we moved to an area that had a support group for families of uh, LGBTQ uh, people is we we found it and we joined it. It was called All. It's still called All. <laughs> and it is based on the scripture, All are alike unto God. And it was there that we really, we didn't even know that we had a gay child yet. We went to better understand um, the issue among our, our people and in our community. And it was, again, we met people, people struggling with the challenges. We met families with gay children. We could see modeled for us healthy relationships. We could also see the heartbreak and the loneliness of LGBTQ people who didn't have the support of a family. And it just, it really solidified for me that the, the, the main issue for me was the suicidality that I, so I witnessed among queer members of the church and just how prevalent it was to have suicide attempts because they did not get and have the support that is not optional, right? It's a, it's a human need. And so the all group was really beneficial for us. Um, we started listening I mean, people were our resources. Mm. We met gay people and had conversations with them about what their life was like in the closet and out of the closet and just how much healthier and freer they felt, how their families reacted. It was really people who educated us and were our best resources. Yeah. Earlier on, we uh, talked about religion and how churches often spend a lot of their time um, allowing straight members of the church to tell other straight members of the church what it's like to be gay. And um, I'm curious what advice you would give. 
this is this is weird territory, um, especially speaking directly to Latter Day Saints, um, because there's a culture within Mormonism that begs um, information to come from card carrying, active, trusted, um, vetted other Latter Day Saints who have a direct and verifiable uh, key to activity in the church. And if you're shaking your head saying that sounds crazy, that is the culture that we have created within Mormonism, that we trust those people who are active, authority-driven, or granted, temple-recommend-holding people. So I preface that, um, this next section, by saying, what advice do you give um, Latter-day Saints from the outside looking in? Because... In, in your situation, that's very much where we're at. And how do Latter-day Saints trust a family like yours to believe that what you're telling them is actually beneficial and true uh, in terms of their own family? That's a lot. That is such a great question. I think you hit it on the head when you said that the impulse is not to trust because trustworthiness is based on orthodoxy, right? And... What I have learned and what I would say is that you know someone who's gay. Maybe you don't know it yet, but chances are you do. And whether or not you are aware of someone in your family, in your extended family, in your congregation who is gay, whether or not you know specifically who that is, they're there. Statistically, they're there. And... How would you want, picture someone you love, how would you want them to understand themselves? How would you want them to understand God's love for them? How would you want them to understand their potential for happiness and fulfillment in this life? And speak to them from the highest love that you can find. Because what I have understood for myself is that when I am grounded in love, I don't make mistakes. I don't regret what happens. And the thing that I just keep coming back to over and over and over again is that I've never met a gay person who told me that they were fine not living as their true and authentic selves. What they said was, I don't think I can continue to live unless I am my true, authentic self. And so this comes down to a person's life. More often than not, we're talking about someone not wanting to live. And if keeping the rules is more important to you than someone's life, you get to make that choice. But I think for most people, when they focus on someone they know and love struggling with that, it just becomes different. It's a different feeling. It's a, there's a different stake or something different is at stake is how I should say that. And each person is going to have to grapple with that individually. But to me, if I can be the means by which someone chooses to stay alive, I will do that every time. One of my favorite quotes is the Dalai Lama who said, um, the purpose of life is to help others. But if you can't help, please don't hurt them. And I think that a lot of folks who are Orthodox, and there are some core issues that just chafe against what they think should be the right path, and this being one of those issues, I think when that happens, they are faced with, I think this, I think, I think you're, you're, you're either helping or hurting. And, um, and, and I know that good people the churches are full of mostly good people. I've been there my whole life. And I think that we as a people, as a community, as a congregation and church want to serve and want to help others. And I think this is the next frontier for all churches is to figure out how they can really love in the way that, that, that they, that the uh, LGBT community wants to be loved. Cause these are, as, as she said, in your congregation, there are your sons and your daughters and your brothers and your sisters that that are gay and are, are silent or not. 
and and how you respond to them i think i was going to say like you might be judged but i think it's more about how you would judge yourself the, the mistake you might look back and so and, and regret that and i would say that that you're either the opportunity to help is there um and so maybe asking yourselves those questions now be, if you don't know anyone you know how would i react what would and give that some thought and there doesn't have to be a dec it doesn't have to be a a conflict really you can coexist in your in your in your faith and and, and love all um and and i think that that i think is the core tenet that i would that i would remind myself i think and remind others is that uh um it is lo it is loving to 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 accept them and to love them and and that and that will be something that you will never regret. As you um, reflect on your experiences, both in and out of the church, and as you've been able to navigate this world with both your uh, brother and a daughter, uh, who have unique um, and special experiences surrounding this topic, who also share um, some joint pain that was caused by uh, religious trauma and religious leaders. If you had an opportunity to sit with the, the Q15, with the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve or the Mormon Church, uh, those who make um, and direct rules and uh, policies specific to people that you love, what advice, um, what things would you tell them from your perspective that might influence them for the better? Wow. I've got this one. Yeah. <laughs> One of the articles of faith that is really kind of an encapsulation of what we believe um, as members of the church states that we believe all that God has revealed and will yet reveal, and that I can't remember the exact wording right now, but he will yet reveal many important things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And so it is written into the code of what we believe that God has not told us everything his process of revelation is ongoing. And yet, because we are humans who crave certainty and because we are a patriarchal church, we have this need to know and to know everything and to have it solved and to have it explained. And so those two things are in conflict with each other because if God still has more to say that he hasn't yet said, how can we act like we have all of the answers, especially for something like queer people. I remember sitting in uh, my ward, there was a man who, in our congregation and he was with his fourth wife. I don't know the history of everything that had happened, but I know there were a couple deaths and he had was now sealed in the temple to wife number four. And I remember looking at him and thinking, that's incredible. Like we are so committed to the fact that humans need, man is not meant to be alone. He needs intimacy and companionship, friendship, connection. And we are so committed to that idea that we will let this man be married and sealed in the temple four times with full faith that God will be able to work that out in a way in which all the parties are happy. And because Several members of the Quorum of the Twelve are also married and sealed to more than one woman. I would guess that they would agree with that, that somehow God in his infinite love and wisdom has a plan for a man who's married to multiple women where everybody is happy. And yet no one is born a polygamist. That's not an orientation. It's the satisfying of a human need. And yet we now fully believe and accept that people are born gay. And yet we don't believe that a loving, caring God can work that out to the satisfaction of, of all involved. We have to control their process and deprive them of the very thing that humans need the most, which is that loving, connected, intimate, primary relationship that this brother in my ward has now had with four different women. I'm happy for him. I, want, I don't want him to be alone. That, that is, people die, literally die of loneliness. It's a huge contributor to health factors, implications. And so I would want them to consider the, the fact that this makes no sense, 
God can work this problem out, but he can't work this problem out and then hold that in kind of the the scaffolding of of this article of faith that we believe God has a lot more to reveal. So what is the problem with letting people satisfy the human need for intimacy and connection and trusting our loving Father in heaven to work that out? And I want to dovetail that because the typical response from a Latter-day Saint is that the doctrine of marriage will never change. The definition of marriage will never change. And to that, and I love exactly what you just said, I want to dovetail this point. The definition of marriage within Mormonism has already changed. It's already changed. If it hadn't changed, then I want to ask you, how is your polygamous marriage treating you? The church changed the doctrine of marriage already, and they could do that again, or will do that again, if some have their way, uh, to allow exactly what you're saying, the the fulfillment of human need. What's interesting is all the doctrines change because of outside pressures. 100%. And so, and so you can, you know, what would I say? I, I would say, let's be real. You're going to have to change this eventually, you know? Um, and I, I think that I, I've always said like the church has a huge PR. Whoever runs the PR for, mm-hmm. for the church is horrible at their job because there's so many missed opportunities. There's so many overtly hurtful things like the November 15 policy down to just other things that were just, and so I feel like, uh, I almost feel like if I had an audience with the Quorum of the Twelve, um, I would take it seriously and I would, I would, we would share these thoughts. But in back of my mind, I would be like, how, I don't know how this is getting received because you're talking to people who were literally believe they were anointed. Like there's just so much that's gone into them getting to where they are. It changes super hard there. But I would share that message that, um, that um i think the i think to to be able to retain not not well at the very least to not hurt there's 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 a lot of 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 pain and suffering and and suicide and and i think that that's probably where i'd focus my energies if i had an audience with them and i think another uh, important part of this discussion is um inviting those members of the quorum of the 12 to come on down to where this uh issue exists yeah when, when you spend a lot of your time in an office building at 50 North Temple in Salt Lake City, mm-hmm. there's not a lot of opportunity to see the grassroots um, and faces behind these policies that are created. And I think that is similar to what you're talking about here. The, the method and the path that Latter-day Saint leaders have followed to get to where they're at has given them uh, a disadvantage at seeing and understanding and experiencing this topic firsthand. And we see that there's a much better opportunity to run to, to support, to lift at a grassroots level yeah. in our local wards and branches and the groups like all that you talked about, Sarah. Um, all Arizona has a vibrant uh, group of Latter-day Saint leaders, um, La- uh, Mormons who are very active in the church who are supporting the queer community. How is that possible? Um, how is that possible if not for being so close and intimate and understanding of the actual person? That's where change happens. Yeah. Is at the grassroots level, level we see a much um, a larger and more expansive tent than we see in the uh, upper administrative levels of the Mormon church. And that's how it's going to happen. Because it's an echo chamber. There. Like, like the, that's that's the problem. Is is I think what you're describing is really that's how the change will occur. And has uh, historically everything from the way we sing hymns to the 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 hotness of the caffeine or the tobacco that's consumed. Uh, all all of those factors in Mormonism changed because of uh, the grassroots advocating for something different. Mm. And welcome to Mormonism. Well, that was a long way around um, our history. I want to kind of wrap the podcast with um, just kind of some final thoughts. What did you want the audience to take from your interview? What compelled you to sit on the couch today and say, if anything, I wanted the audience to know this. What did what didn't we talk about that you wanted to talk about? I I could. I really was fascinated by the way in which 
I received confirmation to leave the church. It was exactly the same way that I had received confirmation of every other good thing, every other next step in my life. And that was quite surprising to me because I had the teaching that leaving was wrong and bad and I was jeopardizing everything and it was absolutely the wrong decision to make. And what I would want people to know is that we are all gifted an internal knowing that is right on and that me trusting that in addition to trusting the loving God that Mormonism had taught me to know and love, I just knew, I just knew in a way that you can only describe as to me the spirit and an inner knowing that not only was this exactly the place that God had intended that I be, but with these children in this situation, and that he trusted me to do exactly what was right because I listened to myself, and that if by some stretch of the imagination I made a wrong choice, he could totally handle it. It was not a deal breaker. All of my favorite stories are about God loving the one, about him welcoming, you know, people who are lost, sheep who are lost, finding coins that are lost, and that if perhaps I was that lost person, it was going to be fine, and that I could trust myself, I could trust God's love for me, and that that was really all that I needed to be worried about. The opinions of other people, um, while hurtful, had no bearing on that self internal witness and the love of God that I felt. That's hard to follow. That's great. Um, yeah. I, I, uh, what would I share? I would say, um, gosh, this is great advice. Follow your heart. Um, yeah, I don't want to, don't want to follow that up. It's just too good. Ditto. Oh, I like that. <laughs> Patrick Swayze and Demi Moore approve. <laughs> Sarah, Dan, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for uh, spending some time with the Latter-day Stories audience, for being vulnerable and candid and sharing your stories. Um, it's not easy. It's not easy to um, kind of lay all this out on the table and show vulnerability and show mistakes and show where you could have done better. Um, it's also not easy to be critical, and it's not easy to shine light into dark spaces that have intentionally remained dark by omission and commission, where sometimes it takes people like you to say enough is enough. And we demand that our next generation have a life that's fulfilling and beautiful and all the things that they deserve. So thanks for doing the hard work. Thanks for being allies. Amen. Amen. Thanks for like, yeah. thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. For those, um, you are, your Arizonites. Yes. Arizonians. Mm -hmm. um, for those in your area, for those who listen to the podcast episode, um, who feel a connection, um, how can they get a hold of you if that's okay? Is there, um, is there an opportunity for families uh, in situations similar to yours to reach out to you? Absolutely. I would love nothing more. Um, I am on Instagram, Fisk Sarah, F as in fun, I-S-K-S-A-R-A. And that's probably the easiest place for people to get a hold of me. And you podcast as well. I do. I have a podcast called The Ex Good Girl Podcast. And it is one of my favorite things to do. I love it so much. And you can listen to it wherever you get your podcasts. Yeah. Just find me on Facebook, Dan Fisk, you know, married to her. <laughs> <laughs> I love and I would, it. I would love if anyone feels connected to, talk, to reach out to me or her, I'd, I'd, I'd love to have a conversation and be, you know, talk and, and, and be friends. So please. Thank you. Uh, thank you again for sharing that. And thank you to the audience. For those of you who are watching on a video version of the podcast, we invite you to share your comments. Um, and as you have, we thank you for that. And, and we appreciate the comment section because it allows us to have an open conversation about this topic and it allows the community to kind of bond together in shared experience. So uh, on our Facebook and our YouTube channels, we invite you to click on the uh, comment section and share your comments as well. We also invite you to like and leave us a rating wherever you're catching uh, this audio or video podcast episode. 
For those of you who are listening on an audio version, if you will subscribe to this channel and also give us a rating, it does us wonders in the ability uh, for us to reach out to other people who find topics like this and episodes like this beneficial. It helps us to build bigger and stronger bridges between the LDS and LGBTQ community. But most importantly, it's stories like yours, it's stories like mine, and it's stories like Dan and Sarah's that help each, us, help each of us continue writing our own latter gay stories.